Welcome everyone uh, to today's webcast, how to get attackers to contain themselves. Uh, I will be uh, not talking very much during this, this webcast and let other smart people uh, or these smart people uh, do the talking for this webcast. Uh, so I have with me Mr. Joff Thayer. He is a security analyst for Black Hills Information Security and a Security Weekly host. Joff, welcome to the webcast today. Hello, Paul. Good to be here. I'm, I, uh, I think you just called me a smart person, so actually I'm pretty impressed by that. There you go. Well, you are. Uh, <laughs> Eyal Nimani is here from Javelin. He's a, a senior security researcher. Eyal, welcome. Hey, thank you. Uh, and I am um, glad both of you are here with us today uh, to provide this information to our audience. I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, and informative. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items, right? Everyone who registers for our webcast gets all of the materials. That includes the slides in addition to the video. Um, so you have to leave early or whatever. Uh, all those will be made available to you. If you can't see a slide, don't worry. We usually post a link to the slides in the chat room. So you can follow along with the slides uh, and, you know, enlarge them and zoom in as much as you want to get all the details, you know, while you're listening to the webcast, uh, which is great. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. PSW at securityweekly.com uh, uh, reaches the entire team. Uh, so if you have any questions about this webcast or any housekeeping items, administrivia, uh, that is the email address to do it, psw at securityweekly.com. If you have questions during the webcast, go ahead and type them into the chat. Those will be relayed to me uh, here in the studio, um, and we'll try and set aside time to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, and the agenda for today, first, Joff is going to talk about the current processes and technology for moving laterally inside an organization uh, on their Active Directory infrastructure, uh, which is awesome. Joff's a, a full-time penetration tester uh, and has actually fresh off the heels from a couple of assessments that involved Active Directory. Um, so we get some more stories as well, which is great. Uh, then Eyal will talk about detecting and containing attackers inside of Active Directory. Eyal's got some slides in addition to a demo uh, on how if you're on the blue team or if you're on the red team and making recommendations to the blue team, uh, how you can contain this lateral movement, detect it, and... Uh, prevent it as well. Okay. Uh, my, again, my contribution here is very, uh, very light. I just want to talk briefly about Microsoft Active Directory. I don't have uh, exact statistics. Uh, if you engage with Javelin, uh, they have done the research for the adoption of Microsoft Active Directory uh, and have some great statistics around that that I've seen in their, some of their previous slide decks. Um, but let's just go with Microsoft Active Directory is the most widely adopted directory service on the planet um, today. And it has the widest uh, adoption. And of course, you know, there's the actual numbers to back that up. I think we're all in agreement. It's the most widely adopted and in the most enterprises today. Um, I think we can also agree that Microsoft, was design, uh, Microsoft designed Active Directory with usability in mind with the ability to be able to share and access resources to spe specify what that usability is rather than security. And we call it insecure by design because it was designed to allow users to share stuff and gain access to resources. Um, once on the inside, and I think Joff will kind of skip that step, right? Usually we fish our way on the inside. If there's a physical or social engineering attack, those are two very tried and true successful methods for getting inside of an organization the most common thing to abuse is Active Directory. Um, and they primarily attackers are using that to steal information, right? Abusing credentials, stealing information, stealing intellectual property, uh, things of that nature. Now, some unscientific research, I've interviewed dozens of penetration testers, collectively across the board, um, penetration testers have told me that very few organizations have really secured Active Directory. It tends to be one to five percent of the tests that they're performing um, have, uh, you know, properly secured Active Directory. Uh, you know, recently we met with uh, Rapid Seven. Um, I've talked to uh, Jabra, Josh Abrams. Uh, all, you know, all of these folks, folks at Black Hills Information Security. You all have the same story with Active Directory, right? It's in every, almost every target that you're going after, depending on the scope of the engagement. And when it is very few are able to secure it, which is why uh, we like to partner with folks like Javelin and do these webcasts and various segments on Active Directory security. It's one of the major problems, I think, and security challenges that most of us have today. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joff, who's going to present the first part of this webinar today uh, and talk about moving laterally and some tips and tools and techniques that have been successful. So Joff, take it away. All right. Thanks very much, Paul. So uh, yeah, Paul asked me to join in and uh, contribute a few slides to the webcast today because as already stated, um, you know, I spend a fair amount of time performing uh, penetration tests, uh, which include uh, a lot of internal testing and a lot of uh, what we at Black Hills call uh, uh, command and control and pivot testing. So the way I'm going to talk about this is we're going to assume that we do have a, a position in the network. And as Paul just stated, um, the gaining that position in the network uh, may be through any number of mechanisms um, are commonly done today, uh, you know, with uh, email phishing, uh, things like running uh, HTA, HTML, HTML applications from Internet Explorer uh, to run, uh, you know, DLLs dynamically loaded in memory to drop shellcode uh, into memory. That might be uh, something like a Cobalt Strike or it might be a Metasploit uh, C2 channel, uh, it might even be a PowerShell Empire channel, just something to give us a shell access uh, into that environment. And that is the starting point. And of course, the starting point in uh, <clears throat> most of these environments that we're penetration testing is likely to be a non-administrative uh, regular user in the environment. Now, if, if the user is already administrative, um, you know, penetration testers and attackers uh, I sort of going to jump up and down and get very right. excited. Yeah, saves and you a step. Can... Saves you a step. And, and the feedback that I've heard, Joff, a lot of times when we talk about these techniques is folks will say, well, that requires, you know, local administrator privileges. Still today, privilege escalation on Windows is not all that difficult, right? There's lots of ways to escalate privilege in a, on a Windows machine. Well, I, th I think it, it depends um, on, on the environment, of course, on mm -hmm. the environment maturity. Um, and, you know, as I just alluded to, in some cases, uh, you drop into a desktop and you're already administrative uh, right. locally, which is, uh, uh, first of all, very bad practice. If anybody mm -hmm. listening uh, it has an environment that's in that situation, then you need to start doing the work immediately to to lock that down and, and, and drag that administrative privilege away from, from the users. Effectively, though, you know, once we've landed that position, um, there's essentially uh, three things that, that we're actually going to do here. And we're going to... Try right. to escalate. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Go slide. ahead and say next slide, Joff. Sorry. When, when you're ready to go yes. to the next slide. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. Yeah. We're going to, you know, we're going to perform some, some reconnaissance activity um, more than likely. And that reconnaissance activity um, is going to involve uh, much of Active Directory, to be honest, because Active Directory is a source uh, of a wealth of information in, in that environment. The other step that as an attacker we're going to do if we haven't already achieved it uh, is we're going to attempt to uh, escalate our privileges. Now, escalating our privileges could be escalating local privileges, could be escalating uh, on a domain basis the privilege, or even both, uh, you know, really depending on which vector of escalation attack uh, is, is successful. Um, and then the third thing we're going to do once we have obtained some privileges is we're going to attempt to move laterally in the environment. And for the most part, moving laterally in the environment pretty much involves starting a process on a remote system using that privileged credential that we have, have obtained. Now, that process that we start on a remote system is more than likely going to be another command shell process that is relaying traffic back through our first system that we have compromised. Um, next slide, Paul. Yes, sir. So with respect to recon, just to break it down a little bit, you're often going to see penetration testers and attackers uh, use a combination of techniques that involve either living off the land uh, and or involve some PowerShell or .NET enabled tools that are going to leverage uh, ADSI and LDAP information fairly extensively. When you're living off the land, uh, you're really talking about SMB protocol, RPC DCOM communications back to the Active Directory. Uh, net group, group name, for example, is going to bring us group information uh, about that environment. It involves us having some sort of CMD.exe, having some sort of shell access, right, which we can fork or spawn off of our C2 channels. Uh, net account slash domain will give us account policy. Net local group, a, a, a local group name will give us the members of that local uh, administrator group, as an example, uh, to see maybe if we're in the administrator group already. 
Uh, net users is very commonly used to give us a full list of accounts within that environment. And then our, our friend NetView slash domain and even NetUse I didn't put on there, but NetView is going to potentially give us a view of systems. Now, as opposed to living off the land using the net suite of commands, we can also use various PowerShell scripts that are accessing uh, the wealth of uh, information that we can get from uh, from .NET, uh, and it's there's there's a number of frameworks that are now written out there, um, very very useful. One of the popular ones is uh, Powersploit, uh, also combined with the PowerShell Empire project. What I tend to find myself doing uh, when I'm in an environment and starting that reconnaissance process is actually build myself a small cradle that is simply designed to download a base64 encoded PowerShell script and put that script block into memory so I don't end up writing any PowerShell script evidence to disk on, on that environment. So it's interesting, Jeff. Basically, internally, you build your own dropper so you can encode PowerShell and drop it onto systems and run in That's memory. Right. That's right. And, and, it, and it literally can be just a couple of lines of PowerShell um, sure. that you're that you're just executing, um, and then the only other uh, thing that you need to do, obviously, is have some sort of uh, TLS web listener out there, or even plain text HTTP, I want to get to that in a minute, mm. that is hosting the PowerShell scripts in Base64 encoded form, allows me to bring them down, and as soon as I get those script blocks into memory, I can then use various applets to start performing reconnaissance around the environment. Now, the reason I mentioned TLS versus non-TLS, something that we've been discovering recently is people are getting a lot better about securing their TLS in their environments. Uh, and they're doing things such as making sure the certificate has to be legitimate. They're even doing things as, uh, as in checking the uh, domain age. They're checking um, that uh, you are truly using a domain name through a perimeter proxy instead of just using an IP address. So I found myself recently kind of tilting back to good old-fashioned HTTP hmm. and doing things like double encoding the PowerShell scripts and pulling down that information. So very good timing on the next slide, Paul. So naturally, once we have pulled some of these things into memory in the case of PowerShell, we're going to start some recon, um, such as invoke ShareFinder out of the PowerSploit project, invoke FileFinder. And these things are going to run around looking for uh, shares and files and information out of that environment. There's also GetNet user and get, GetNet group and so forth. And what you're going to see is a lot of, uh, a lot of LDAP and ADSI queries uh, will be generated out of the uh, LDAP you know, oriented uh, scripts. A lot of them are ADSI written. And then um, those queries are going to uh, not look as normal as regular user traffic. Users will do these kinds of queries, but not in this volume, uh, typically. Um, so, you know, you'll see two types of traffic, right? Um, not, not exclusively from a network perspective, but just in general in the environment. You're going to see your RPC, DCOM, and SMB2 requests all going to the domain controller environment with these SAM account management requests, especially for the net commands. And you're also going to see all this LDAP and ADSI queries coming from the various PowerShell tools that, that I would be using. Now, uh, Black Hills did a, a, a webcast not so long ago on also living off the land uh, using uh, the system internals tools. So one of the ones I threw into the slide here uh, was Active Directory Explorer uh, by Mark Rosinovich. But mm -hmm. what's interesting about that is that if you can run that, now more often than not, you actually need some sort of remote desktop protocol or GUI environment to, to work with that. But if you can run that, and uh, there is a there is an option to actually get a copy essentially of Active Directory, pull it off the uh, environment, download it, and then examine the structure of the environment without interacting directly with the environment for some period of time hmm. before going back to the test. So this is this is kind of an interesting aspect uh, of some of the things. Yeah, that and and I think that's a great point, Joff. You know, I I think there's two kind of uh, indicators of compromise that you can try and measure that I think Javelin does a much better job at, you know, presenting some of those, uh, you know, artificially intelligent fake elements in Active Directory and doing that very smartly, right? If you don't have that, 
like you're forced to look at volume of transactions or, or anomalies in your logs, which can be very challenging, especially as you said, if you're doing some of your analysis offline, that's not going to show in your logs. Some of the other approaches are, well, I can look at it and say, well, this user normally doesn't connect to that share, or when this user connects to that share, it's usually not a gigabit uh -huh. of traffic, it's usually, you know, a couple of megs, and so that's anomalous. You know, however, if you're going kind of low and slow, you can get underneath the radar of some of those checks, uh, and also the volume of information that you have to go through to discover that level of information can be difficult. I'm not saying you shouldn't do some of those things, but do know that there are limitations, right? Because while Joff has typically a week to do a pen test, a real attacker has all the time in the world, and if they want to be re very, very stealthy, those methods may not pick up on their activity until it's too late. That's right. That's that's exactly right. And, and the other thing, right. even even with you know sort of a week time frame, uh, normally at the recon phase where we're just querying a little bit of information here and there out of Active Directory, um, we don't typically get caught. Right. Yeah. We're just pulling information back. Right. Um, for for our consumption. Now it's not until you get into uh, potential escalation where you have the uh, much higher uh, probability of actually getting caught because right. you're going to leave some more noise, right? Mm -hmm. Now, again, with local privilege escalation, we've got a number of tools that we can use. Um, uh, PowerSploit folks and you know Matt Graber and crew, really, really good toolkit of stuff they've got there. Uh, PowerUp.ps1 is very good. There's a nice uh, applet there called Invoke All Checks that gives us a beautiful readout uh, on misconfigured services, DLL hijacking opportunities, um, you know, credentials existing in unattended.xml. Maybe the MSI always installed with elevated privileges. Key is set. It's surprising. Sometimes I find that set in pretty well matured environments, and it's like an easy win for me because all I need to do in that particular case is drop an MSI that adds me as a local user to the system uh, and adds me to the administrative uh, group. Right. Interesting. So there's a lot of lot of interesting things that that can be done there. Now, <clears throat> local privilege escalation doesn't always give you what you need. The first thing you do get out of that is the ability to run something like Mimikatz to dump credentials out mm -hmm. of memory. And if a higher powered user has logged into that system uh, recently, what you're depending on is some sort of cached credential is going to be in the LSAS memory when you dump those credentials. Now, in the case of Windows 10 with Credential Guard, um, typically you're only going to get a hash, but past the hash attacks are still possible if you're able to extract a hash out of LSAS. One of the things I've noticed with Windows 10, though, if the user is active, and, and somebody could probably tell me the technical reason for this, I haven't been able to chase this one down, but if the user is active, sometimes I actually do get a plain credential uh, plain text credential out of uh, dumping Mimikatz, uh, even though Credential Guard is active. So it's kind of interesting. Um, domain privilege escalation, on the other hand, uh, we're going to look for things such as credentials in group policy preference files. We're going to use techniques such as password spraying uh, and Kerberosting. And what we're looking for there is obviously a hit on uh, a credential that has some privileges in that environment. Now, I neglected to mention, I don't want to make this all about a pen testing webcast, but mm -hmm. I neglected to mention that um, in our recon, uh, one of the other tools that we will use is likely the Bloodhound series uh, of scripts, which allow us to get a visual mapping of the Active Directory environment uh, from uh, groups, user information, trusts, and session information. Um, and once we've got that mapping of the environment, then we get some tactical in information as to how we want to proceed and what credentials are useful for us as we start to move around in that environment. So the, you know, the next step here is lateral movement. Um, we are clearly looking for a credential that exists on another system, sometimes with respect to local administrative credentials. Believe it or not, there's still the issue of widespread local admin uh, on workstations that is not a domain privileged uh, credential, but is locally administrative on lots and lots of systems. So if we're able to extract a local credential and try it against other systems, we're very quickly going to work out whether we can move around in that environment. Uh, commonly, uh, I will uh, either perform some sort of SMB protocol login scan in the local subnet, 
uh, or alternatively, that's that's rather noisy, just so you know. Mm. Uh, alternatively, I might actually look for systems. Let's say I've Kerberosed. Look for systems that the service principal name from the Kerberos ticket extraction and cracking process actually matches some sort of server. Um, typically, you're going to find a Microsoft SQL server. You might find a web server that has a service principal name on it. And it's very, very common in the case of Kerberosing for that credential that you actually crack from a Kerberos ticket to be administrative on the system where the service is installed. Uh, and so if that is the case, we very quickly get into a situation where further dumping of credentials on a server system more than likely gives us a wider uh, range of creds and right. subsequently. <laughs> yeah, so you're just, I mean, you're collecting credentials and uh, it sounds like there's a couple of different ways to access some of this data, right? <clears throat> you use that credential to access a server that's running some process like a database so you can gain access to the database. You're using those credentials potentially to connect to file shares uh, on, on servers as well that may contain data. But you can also use those to target specific workstations that may have local data. It's like exactly. it doesn't even matter where your data lies. Uh, as you're escalating privileges and cracking different accounts and, and gaining access, you're spreading out how many, how many resources basically you can gain access to. That, that's exactly right. And, and a lot of pen testers make the mistake, and it's easy to get into this trap, of actually getting so hungry for domain administrative level priv. And sure. obviously that gives you a lot of power. Yeah. But, um, you know, I find myself falling into that uh, sometimes as well. But if you step back and you think about it for a moment, the local privileges that you're able to obtain across the environment often give you access to sensitive data. Mm -hmm. And ultimately in a pen test, what we want to demonstrate is that we have access to data that they would consider extremely sensitive and it represents significant business risk. The business owner, the, the, the person who's evaluating that risk, they don't really care about domain administrator. What they care about is how did you get hold of my stuff and how can we fix that, right? Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. I don't always get domain administrative uh, privilege, often I do, but uh, in some cases, even without getting it, I can demonstrate significant access to data, significant potential damage as an attacker. The protocols and mechanisms we move for uh, use for lateral movement, um, definitely good old fashioned PS exec is still quite po uh, uh, quite popular. Let's see if I can work, find an English word there. Um, PS exec uh, is relatively noisy in, in terms of eventing. Uh, what happens with PS exec is you administratively log into a remote system, then you start an actual Windows service uh, and the service fires off a process, which is probably going to be your command and control traffic, uh, uh, sorry, your command and control shell, and then the service is deleted. Now, when you start a remote service on a Windows workstation, you're going to see uh, event 7045 that'll occur right after the uh, login event. And uh, that's, that's a fairly obvious indicator of uh, lateral movement activity in an environment. And if people are not watching for that on, on individual machines in a mature environment, I, I'm surprised, right? Um, another mechanism that we can use when we're laterally moving is to use WMIC. And WMIC allows us to specify a node, a username, and a password. Uh, and with that, we can certainly uh, create a remote process in the same way. Uh, the interesting thing about WMIC is it does not produce much in the way of event logs. And so it's a stealthier way uh, to create a process on a remote system uh, normally without being seen. Now, I'm not quite sure why WMIC doesn't generate more event logs, but that appears to be the state of the world uh, currently. Um, there is some Kali, Linuxy, Unixy versions of WMIC that are able to pass the hash. Um, I don't typically use them, uh, but it you know, often I don't even need them. Um, the same with PS exec, we can uh, use a pass the hash attack there. Remote desktop protocol uh, can come in handy if, if some of these other avenues are cut off. I've seen environments where people do enforcement on SMB protocol, they don't allow uh, TCP port 445 to go laterally across the network and they, they're, doing, they're doing horizontal segmentation if you like, uh, which is a very, very good move. It helps uh, lock things down, but what you often find is that Windows Remote Des Desktop Protocol over uh, TCP 3389 is very commonly allowed to servers. And so you just change your tactic and you go after the servers instead of going after the uh, 
lateral systems in the environment. Uh, Windows remoting over HTTP and HTTPS in uh, more of the Win 10, Win 2012 kind of environments. And then there's some really interesting lateral move uh, movement techniques uh, using DCOM, uh, DC RPC over, over, uh, over again, uh, TCP 445, where you, where you can do some things like create uh, DDE uh, related documents. You can create XLL, which is office documents loading DLLs. Uh, with uh, Excel or Windows, uh, you can create objects through Outlook and so forth. So there's there's lots of interesting techniques that you can use to, to to laterally move to actually essentially create processes on remote systems because that's really what the lateral movement piece of this is about. It's about getting that access as a privileged user to then create a process on the remote system and do with it what you need to do. So next slide, are we out? We're javelin time. Okay, well, I think I've used up my time all the way up to about 25 minutes, so our timing <laughs> is good. Uh, so with, with that introduction, uh, I'll throw it back to you, Paul, and uh, we'll let javelin uh, have, yes. have a shot and, here. Uh, now I'd like to turn over to Clayton. Uh, Clayton's joined us, Clayton Fields. Clayton, welcome. Hey, Paul, how are you? Good, how are you, Clayton? I'm good. I can't see the slides, so you may have to prompt me. Uh, I just okay. see the white background, but very, very good to be on. I appreciate that great overview on pen testing. You know, he highlighted why uh, domain security is such a big issue today, and um, you know, very, very appreciative for him providing that perspective. Yeah, that was really a uh, great job on how the attacks work. Uh, I think it's now very interesting to talk about how we actually protect our environments against <laughs> these types of attacks. Uh, it, you're on the slide on top recent campaigns, Clayton, just so you know. Okay, great. So I, I just want to talk at a high level, uh, five or 10 minutes, and then I want to give the, the floor over to Al, where he can provide lab demonstration of some of these concepts that, um, that we're referring to. So the, the first thing we always like to start with is, is just a level set with the community that, you know, every security company that you're reading uh, threat briefings from, and most red teams will tell you, uh, Active Directory is not only the most popular attack surface, but the largest attack surface. And this is often a really misunderstood uh, discussion point. Um, if you can flip to the next slide. The reason it's misunderstood is that um, a lot of people think the attack surface for AD is the domain controllers. They think, you know, well, it's it's not an endpoint problem, it's a domain controller problem. And the CISO says, well, I don't really own that. You know, CIO owns that. Um, so they, they kind of point fingers at each other about, you know, who owns this problem. Uh, this is a joint problem. Uh, it, is, it is an infrastructure problem because you have something that's, you know, vulnerable by design. Any, any directory service that trusts the user uh, is going to have some, you know, by design vulnerability and exposing data to compromised users. And uh, it also helps the attacker learn the environment um, from any endpoint, any connected user. Um, so these are examples, you know, why it's the largest attack surface and, and most common. Um, and if you'll flip to the next slide, you know, what, what Javelin uh, wants to do and is doing today is using zero detection uh, cyber resiliency concepts, uh, which I have to give a shout out to MITRE. You know, they're doing a lot of great research uh, around this issue and, and how to build compensating controls around these issues. Um, so, you know, talk to your local MITRE folks if you, if you have them. But... Um, zero detection cyber resiliency basically says, you know, build containment strategy that does not care how your adversary compromises your endpoint. And this is really a game changing conversation for the defender, because today all the machine learning technologies and all the AI technologies and all the signature based technologies, behavioral based technologies, they're making the assumption that they know something about the tradecraft that's going to be used in that attack. And we have to stop making that assumption. Uh, we have to start realizing that there's always going to be something new. Software is created by people. It's never going to be perfect. Um, so start building compensating controls that allow the defender to contain the attacker without pre-knowledge of how that endpoint, how that user is going to be compromised. And so this uh, concept, this cyber uh, resiliency concept, zero detection, uh, is something Javelin fully embraces. You know, we want to uh, empower the defender to contain compromises and breaches without having to have pre-knowledge uh, of their adversary and, and worry about what new tactics are going to be used against them in the breach uh, process. In other words, I don't care the kind of dynamite you use to open the door. I don't care what kind of social engineering you use uh, to expose the user. 
Uh, I don't care what your memory exploit looks like. I don't care what your script looks like. Uh, if you use Active Directory to get off that box, uh, Javelin's going to get you. And, and this is our methodology. Um, this is what AL is going to demonstrate uh, when, when we get into the lab in just a few minutes. Um, so, Paul, you know, if you have any comments on zero detection, cyber resiliency, and and where it fits in the future of cybersecurity, you know, all, all ears. I like I like the containment aspect <clears throat> that you mentioned. That like, no matter what the threat is or the technique, that we need to we need to do some kind of containment, right? And my example that I used earlier was, sure, there might be some detection mechanisms we can put in place for Active Directory that rely on your SIM, that rely on looking at what your users are doing and you doing some user behavior analytics. However, those solutions don't protect you enough in the case of Active Directory, in my opinion, which is why we like partnering with, ja partnering with Javelin, because we get that level of containment and we get that level of uh, visibility and the ability to stop attacks before they get further into our network. So... Um, that, that was a great summary, and uh, I completely agree with you. I, a, a, a metaphor I often use, attackers are moving at code speed, mm -hmm. and defenders are moving at human speed. And how do you contain somebody who's already got a running start on you? Right. Right? Um, in, in the examples that you were given earlier, um, if the attacker can learn your environment and learn how they're going to compromise the environment, it doesn't matter how many roadblocks you put in front of them. It doesn't matter how many times you kick them out. Every time they come back, they're still winning. Yep. And, and that and that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? So if you find the malware, you remove the malware. You find a compromised account, you remove the compromised account. The attacker is still building a continuous plan, a continuous map. Every time they re-enter the environment after eviction, they're picking up on their plan where they left off. And with Javelin you never know what that AD topology is. But to the attacker, they don't even know that. Mm -hmm. So this is the beauty that Javelin wants to introduce. It's that uh, the attacker cannot learn the Active Directory from any con connected endpoint. And take it a step further, we're going to use that against them. We're going to control the perception that endpoint has, that user has of the Active Directory. And we're going to use that perception against the attacker. And this is how we don't care how you breach the endpoint. We make the assumption you're going to do it. Hats off to Red Team. You are very good at compromising endpoints. You know, hats off to the persistent threats of the world. You guys are winning. Look at the, look at the news. You're winning. Great job. Uh, we're here to say not any, not anymore. Right? Right. That game is over with. Using Active Directory against your victim and using it from any connected endpoint in the domain, the largest attack surface in the world, we're going to take that away from you and we're going to use it against you. Um, to push you away from this mechanism and, and make you more noisy. Think about this. If you, as a red team, have to go back to network exploitation and mm -hmm. you can't rely on the Active Directory view you have anymore, you're going to go back to very noisy tactics. Right. Or you're just going to focus on, your, on something completely different like an application. Um, sure. And in, in your example, uh, Clayton, you know, when Joff was talking about like you can download the entire Active Directory map, now, Javelin does make that uh, difficult, but if you manage to get a map, if you, you have the, the Javelin product, it's it, you, when the uh, t uh, red teamer or attacker is studying that, they're studying fake information. So as you're planning well, they're studying out- studying Javelin. Yeah. They're studying Javelin, exactly. and, and we want them to study Javelin. We right. want them to do this. I, I, I welcome the pen tester red teamer. Download the view of Active Directory. Feel free to do that. Take, take every service ticket you can. Because uh, when you try to move laterally, when you try to use what you have, the probability we catch you is greater than 90% on your first move. Mm. And every move you make after that, the probability is in my favor. So I encourage Red Team, take all that information you want uh, because they don't even know we're controlling it. Uh, this is a great analogy, Paul. So in terms of the, uh, the rest of the, the deck, I mean, really what it's focused on, you look at the kill chain, I mean, we are uh, very focused on the middle. We, we find a lot of products focused on the beginning and the end. You know, there's next generation AV, next generation EDR, you know, lots of uh, cool features for the beginning and the end of the attack process. But you know, people are losing the fight in the middle. You know, it, it's the fight that they don't even know they're in. When the, when the guys in black suits knock on the door and say, hey, you know, you've got a major problem. Uh, mm. I've got a subpoena for these IP addresses. Can you give me these computers? You know, these are the breaches. Nobody knows they're even in the fight and they're losing the fight uh, that, that they don't even know they're a part of. 
And so we want to uh, really enable the defender to know that, hey, you're in the fight. Whether you like it or not, this guy is, is winning. And here's how he's winning. And here's how we're going to beat him. Uh, we want to automate that process. So make it easier for the blue team uh, to contain the red team and, and, and the, uh, the APT, stop them from continuing this process uh, or force them back into slower, older school methods that are much more uh, noisy and, and other products are already uh, capable of detecting today. Um, so visually what this looks like, if you flip to the next screen, what AL is going to show you in the lab uh, in about two minutes is, is how we control the attacker's perception. And this is how we allow the attacker to contain themselves. Um, so we're going to control the perception that the endpoint has of the service accounts, the privileged user accounts, the admin accounts, the file systems, the SQL servers, the Oracle servers, the ERP, the CRM. Uh, control the perception that, that this uh, adversary has at this endpoint. And as they try to uh, continue to learn the environment, allow them to create their own alerts, to let the blue team know that they're in the, in the environment, uh, and then have Javelin automate the forensic process for memory and file system and automate the containment process on either compromised processes, compromised machines, compromised user accounts, uh, automate that activity so that the defender can get some sleep and know that you know, if they get an alert from Javelin, action is already happening to contain the breach. Um, so this is a visual representation of what the adversary sees. We're essentially uh, plugging the attacker into the matrix. Yeah, I know everybody listening in has probably seen the movie, The Matrix. Uh, we're basically plugging the attacker into our, our own version of the matrix. Uh, this allows us to hide the real environment from the attacker. And uh, it, it is powered by natural language processing, which is gonna provide authentic attributes to the attacker on every piece of the environment that they view. And because we're using proprietary memory manipulation technologies, uh, we're not creating fake stuff. So unlike you know, 40 honeypot vendors that are using honeypots and fake stuff to create deception, uh, we are not making anything fake. There's no fake servers, there's no fake services, there's no fake users. Um, we're, we're not changing the Active Directory structure. We're not introducing pain to the administration of Active Directory. Uh, and, and we have infinite scale here because we're just putting text uh, on a screen. And Clayton, so, uh, there was a question about how containment works. And I, I think if you could spend a, a minute or two talking about how Javelin integrates with the environment, uh, the Active Directory environment, how the, there's no requirement for an agent that you're doing that hooking process to be able to uh, put yourselves in, in the position in Active Directory to do the detection and containment. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Paul, and happy at a very high level to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the bad guys are going to watch this podcast, and, and I have no desire to give them the right. secret magic, <laughs> the secret magic of Javelin. So, hey, all you bad guys watching, just know I'm there, and, and you're not going to find me. Um, so, you know, we're using uh, techniques to control the outputs at the connected user of the queries. So um, it's all driven from the Javelin virtual machine. So client provides us a virtual machine. Uh, they apply a policy on the Javelin application running on that machine of what endpoints they want to protect. We give them that map from their own Active Directory. So we are, from an AD perspective, we are read-only. The only thing we're doing is consuming information about the environment. That's the only thing we're doing to Active Directory. We're taking that information. We're creating the mask. Uh, we're using the authentication process of AD to drive the trigger mm -hmm. to deploy Javelin. So when a user... Uh, types in username, password, authenticates to the domain controller. The Javelin server is going to see that. S Notice I said see it. We're not a proxy. We're not changing how it works. We see it. We connect to that endpoint using uh, uh, readily available protocols, uh, and we deliver uh, the injection. This injection is, uh, is not viewable by the operating system, so the user or the attacker will never know that Javelin exists. There's no operating system presence of Javelin. Uh, there's no running process. There's no persistent agent. There's no uh, file system, you know, Javelin folder, et cetera. This is not like other security tools. Uh, this injection is not persistent. So it's going to exist as long as the user's connected to the domain. Uh, obviously, when the user disconnects from the domain, there should not be a view of the domain. That would give away that something weird is going on. Um, so Javelin is not persistent when you're off the domain. Uh, and Javelin only exists when you connect to Active Directory. So any threat living on an endpoint that comes to an environment after infection and tries to connect to AD, 
the new view they're going to have of AD is controlled by us, which means that we can find the new things that are coming into the environment from uh, infections that happen you know, offline. The containment is also driven from that machine. So when the attacker alerts on themselves interacting with the, uh, the, the image of Active Directory they have, uh, the forensic process is going to run. It's about 90 seconds. We give you memory analysis, file system evidence collection. So we're going to give you shell content from things like Python, PowerShell, command line. Um, we're going to give you file system information, changes to the file system, things that have dropped to the file system. Uh, we're going to give you the offending processes. We're going to give you the Kerberos tickets in memory that are compromised, the cached user sessions, the connected users, cache credentials, um, all the juicy data that you need to defend your Active Directory, which when I talk to companies, it's really hard for them to pull all that together in 90 seconds on a, you know, actively compromised box. Once that forensic process executes and is finished, again, about 90 seconds is average, um, the application is going to launch a containment process which has different uh, layers. So the most popular layer is process containment, where the Javelin virtual machine is going to inject into the compromised process and basically sandbox it from the environment, uh, deny it access to the network, deny it access to the domain. If that process, that compromised process, if that's a bot, the game is over because uh, that bot has no connection anymore. If the local machine is compromised, you know, there's persistence on the local machine. It's, it's not just a hijack process or some kind of reverse shell. There's actually a, a local persistency on the box. Uh, you need to contain the user account, machine account, and device. Now, obviously, that's user disruptive, right? The user's machine is compromised. Um, there is no other option. You've got to get that machine offline as fast as possible and, and disable the accounts that were cached on that machine uh, and start your investigation. So we can automate the rest of that if the client wants to. It's up to the client how invasive to the endpoint they want to be based on their tolerance for risk. Uh, but at a high level, this is the process that Javelin undertakes after the alerts created. All right, uh, Clayton, did you want to turn it over to uh, Al for the demo I portion? I did. So I think the, the most fun part about Javelin is AL. Uh, this guy is a forensic guru, um, used to run an IR program, has been a former military. You know, when he talks about you know, breaching an environment, this is real world stuff. Uh, not to say that he's got personal experience. I'll leave that to him to confirm or deny. But uh, when, when you when you look at, you know, how he describes the problem and how we uh, get smack in the middle of the problem, it's a great demo. So AL, uh, take it away for us. You hear me, by the way? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So let's jump right in. Uh, Clayton made a whole introduction, so I don't need to explain anything. <laughs> I'm just going to show you how, uh, yeah, how we can detect all of that and how attackers will be acting without Javelin first. So I'm going to share my screen right now. All right. Just confirm that you're seeing it. There we go. We can see it now. All Sweet. right. So we're all set. So jumping right in, I'm inside of infected machine. This is my initial foothold, and my goal is to perform initial recon on my network, and eventually to figure out what I can do from now. Uh, so on the left side of the screen, I will be running uh, a PowerShell, which is not really a PowerShell, but uh, it will be a PowerShell eventually. All right. And I'm going to run some basic uh, recon commands, just like mentioned before in the slide. So I'm going to uh, figure out, first of all, who I am. And using who am I, I'm going to see that I'm a weak user. So my next step will be actually testing uh, my privileges using net user. Oops, sorry. And as you can see here, I'm only a domain user. That means that I have no privileges uh, at all inside a domain. Uh, so my next step will be investigating all of uh, the, do the domain admins and all the assets inside the network. So I'll just start with uh, a normal command such as uh, net group domain admins, just to figure out who's down inside the networks. And this is how it looks like without Javelin. Second. All right. 
So this is all that needs inside my network. And I'm going to launch the same thing for domain computers. So we'll get a perspective of how my network looks like. All right. So I'll just keep that open right now. And I'm going to deploy Javelin inside a machine. So as you can see, this is like extremely easy deployment mechanism. A few clicks, and I'm right away inside it. Uh, as Clayton mentioned, there's no decoys, no stuff like that, no fake machines. It's just inside, just a new endpoint uh, perspective. Um, so I'm going to launch the same thing again on the right side. Uh, and you'll see that the perception of the active directory inside the endpoint has been changed. And right now, I have many more machines. Uh, same thing goes to the domain admins command. So. All right, so I have like much more admins. Uh, the next step will be uh, probably elevating my privileges. So as you have seen before, I'm not a privileged user. So the best way to do it uh, is using Mimikatz by dumping the else's process and fetching some cache credentials. So my next step will be just launching Mimikatz. I will keep that. I can close this one. And by one liner, I will be dumping some credentials. As then you can see, uh, I have the weak user over here with its clear text password. If it wasn't a clear text password, then I'll get a hash or a ticket. It doesn't matter. Just for this, uh, this explanation, this demonstration, I'm going to use this one. So um, you can also see the PAP admin. Uh, my next step will be uh, fetching these credentials, saving it on the side for next use. And right now, what I'm going to do is check the credentials of uh, Papa Admin if there if there are privileged credentials or not. So I'm going to launch the same thing. So I'm just leaving it off the land. I'm not adding anything. Uh, the malware is right now operating and leaving off the land. There is no additional tools being used here. And as you can see, uh, it seems like the cached user inside the memory that I just dumped from the LSS process uh, has domain admins privileges. That means I can use it to access the DC, access any endpoint inside the network without any problems. So that's the perspective that we want to give to the attacker once the Javelin is deployed, right? Uh, that he be able to perform every activity with this kind of credentials. Uh, but let's see what happens once you try to uh, use them. So my next step will be also just to make sure I'm, I'm going to use um, PowerView suit that is utilized by, uh, by Bladound and PowerShell Empire uh, to view all the, all the information about the user as well. So I just imported the PowerView suit. And my next step will be checking this user. All right. So I can, t I can clearly see this user is legitimate. Uh, it's active. And the main thing that I want to see here is he is a member of uh, the domain and ring groups. So my next step will be as an attacker, uh, I will probably just try to elevate my privileges using this password or whether it was a hash. So my next step will be uh, performing the run as command with the stolen password. All right. And I'll be copying this. And as you can see, I failed. So from the attacker's perspective, there's no way to, to figure out why I just failed section because the, the legitimate, it was a legitimate credential to use, right? Um, so I, I might also try to use Mimikatz, pass the hash, just in case. Um, here we go. So this command will also launch past the hash attack using these uh, credentials. And it just popped up a new shell with the injected NTLM hash of that user. So my next step will be trying to launch something like PSXEC, just like mentioned in the previous slides.
and again, I get the same result. So I'm, I'm contained inside the endpoint. There's no way I can do anything, any type of lateral movement, any type of real recon. Uh, I, I can't just move outside my my own uh, endpoint. I'm contained inside the fake perception that Javelin just created. So uh, the next move will be uh, maybe trying to fetch some information about other endpoints inside the network. So I'm going to close all of these first of all. I'm going to just pop up a new shell. And I'll be trying to import in PowerView suit again. But this time I'm going to get all the net domain computers. Sorry. Here we go. So I also get all the fake uh, computer list here as well. And what I'm going to do is trying to ping one of these PCs to see if I can get any, uh, any reaction to it. So I'm just picked up a computer from the list and I'll try to ping it. And of course, you're already contained inside the endpoint, so there's no way you can really ping it. Uh, so what's happening really right now in the background is the Javelin has generated some alarms, right? So as you can see, there's the initial uh, run as command that I've, I've just detected. There's also the pass the ash thing that I've seen. And right now, it's also collecting information about the computer information gathering, about the ping command that I've just done. So right now, all of my actions in all of the, all of the ch uh, kill chain that happens inside Active Directory Network uh, is contained and can be demonstrated by Javelin from the uh, from the defender perspective. So I'm going to start right off and just jump to one of the forensics report and see how it looks like. Okay, so as you can see, I have the not PowerShell uh, process right here. Everything is marked in red. It's all got the highest malicious rank. Yeah, it's Mimikatz right here and the PCMD shell. So what I'm going to do is I will be starting with a memory analysis of this shell just to get a clear view of what's going on. I already got all the tools highlighted. And I got the entire shell actually being uh, detected. So this is very cool, but I'm not going to focus on that uh, in this time. So we've, we're right now introducing a new feature called Timeline. So what it actually is, uh, is a feature that's demonstrating the attack step by step uh, from the attacker's perspective. So right now what I can see is my entire operation that I've just demonstrated inside a timeline uh, screen. And what's unique about it is that I can get the entire attack right here on the screen, all the, all the special events that occurred in, inside this attack. And one thing that you won't be able to fetch in any type of uh, EDR solution or any type of forensics investigation mechanisms is a clear view on the attacker's uh, commands and attacker's protocol that he used inside this attack uh, right away inside um, a very simple and visual screen. So right now I can see all of the, the commands that I just performed and by what user it performed, what, what's the time of the attack, uh, what process I've popped and this is like clearly step by step. I can see anything. I can see the, the connections attempts to the DC that I've tried to make. Um, also, I can see this is very unique. I can see the actual LDAP queries that being performed um, by PowerView. This is this has never been introduced before. So I got my own query of uh, of the deception user right here. So I can see that I queried the PAP admin crit. Uh, privileges and uh, just you can see it right off. Uh, also, I can see all the network activity here. And also, unique thing is that we're, we're highlighting the event that uh, made this all attack occur. So, as you can see here, the lightning bolt thing, uh, I, I can show you why we have detected this attack. So, I've detected the, the credential overpass the hash attack inside this machine. So, I'm, I'm highlighting that for to the user so it will be easier to understand what process was responsible for the attack and why. 
So my next step will be probably, all right, I'll, I'll figure out the, the whole attack. I can see the Mimikats right here. It's all clear. Uh, my next step will be to mitigate the, the PowerShell process. So this is the source of the attack. I can do it also to the, to the Mimikats. Now, Paul, what he's showing you here, this can be automated by policy. So if you decide you don't want to make it manual or you have to click this button, you can actually put a policy in here that'll have this happen automatically. Uh, but yeah, that, for the that actually was my was my question, Clayton. So thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> for, for the for the purposes of demo, we like to wait until we're ready to lock ourselves out. Because once we lock ourselves out, this shell is dead. So. Right. Right. Uh, also, as you can see, uh, I've launched a ping command after my first pass the hash attack. So you can also see it here very clearly. Um, and once I'll try to hit the timeline again, right now it's act updated, and I can see that. Someone tried to access a fake computer. And you can see it clearly here, uh, the same computer that I used and what command I used. So it was ping, right? And I got all the evidence to convict the victim, right? I, I got everything right now. Um, my next step is just to contain this process as well. So these are already mitigated. All right. And while he's showing you this, I want to highlight the fact that you know he's talking about uh, not PowerShell.exe, you know, so I, I think it's a common misconception that people think, you know, hey, I can control PowerShell scripts, I can control PowerShell exe, I don't, I don't have these problems. And by design, these APIs are exposed. So, mm -hmm. you know, just because you think you can stop PowerShell exe from running doesn't mean somebody can't uh, hijack that API and do nefarious things or, or learn other vehicles. Uh, the nice thing about Javelin is we don't care. We don't care if you're using malware. We don't care if you're using PowerShell, PowerView, Command Line, Python. It, we don't care. And that really changes the game from a cyber resiliency perspective. Yeah, it's my assessment that it's difficult to control PowerShell uh, in the environment, especially if you're using it to manage and maintain it. Everything that I've seen in the defense arena for PowerShell is pretty weak. Paul, you would be surprised what we hear when we talk to CISOs, we talk to blue teams. Um, you'd be surprised the... The safety they feel with, you know, something like right. script control or something like, yeah. you know, whitelisting or app control, um, you know, they they believe that these issues don't exist. So that's why Al, you know, he takes it a step further and he builds his own exploit kit. <laughs> now, uh, Clayton right. and Al, um, I do, I, I have, I answered the audience questions to the best of my ability because um, I've, I've known Javelin for a, a while now and I'm familiar with your product. Um, if you have more specific questions, feel free to reach out directly. One thing that I'd, I'd like uh, you both to address is was my first question, I think we did the first briefing, which was, you know, if I'm an administrator uh, in the Active Directory as an example, let's say I want to run Bloodhound for my own investigative purposes. Uh, how do I do that and, and kind of sidestep uh, is securely sidestep the, the Javelin uh, AD Protect product to do that. So, yeah, I mean, we've we've got a ton of best practices about how to use Javelin. Um, we're not going to talk about exactly how to do that here because I don't want to expose to the attacker how you're going to try to bypass Javelin. Sure. So, that's fair. AL, that's fair. AL, let, let's not demo that. But for anybody on <laughs> right. anybody on the webcast listening, uh, we've got plenty of best practices on how to do that. Um, sure. We can make it non-invasive for the uh, defender uh, and also for a pen tester. If you, mm -hmm. you want to pull Javelin down because you know we're going to catch the pen tester if he uses AD and, mm -hmm. and you don't you don't want to challenge him that that hard, uh, we can we can show you how to expose you know only the real topology to just the pen tester. Gotcha. Um, so awesome. we've got a lot of customization on how we control the perception and a lot of policy options. Um, and we even build new features for customers. So if the customer, you know, tells me, hey, Clayton, you know, all these great options you have, I need something a little specific for me because this is how my team works. Uh, we've even added features so that we can support, you know, client uh, requests. So let's just let's just say that that's not a problem. Um, okay. That's that's the smallest problem that would exist in a client environment. <laughs> okay, that's fair. And Paul, it's a common question because AD admins get really nervous. When you start yeah. talking about masking Active Directory, the admin is going to fall over in his chair and probably try to quit at the same time. <laughs> um, so, so we want to make sure people know we're, we're not changing AD. We're not going to make the security team's life harder. We're not going to make the admin's life harder. There's a, a lot of customization. Keep in mind, you're dealing with security professionals at Javelin that have been doing this for over a decade. So we, we're not 
um, we have familiarity with all the common challenges admins have, and, and we've uh, tried to address every last one of them in building building AD Protect. Awesome. So uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour, uh, Clayton et al. Um, I want to make sure you, you've uh, covered everything you want to cover for this uh, section of the webcast. Yeah, so we did. Awesome. What we've shown awesome. here is, uh, is how we control the perception, how that um, control is going to make it difficult and allow for better true positive signals uh, to, the, to the blue team. Uh, these better true positive signals are going to be accompanied by, you know, leading edge forensic intelligence about what's happening in the compromise and uh, containment processes to automate what happens after that so the defender can breathe um, and remediate less. You know, Javelin's goal is less remediation, faster containment, uh, and, and the ability to create your own threat intelligence. I think that's the last kind of comment I would make to the audience. You know, it's great to buy intelligence from other companies, kind of know what other companies are seeing and dealing with. The best intelligence you can create is your own intelligence. These are attackers that are coming after you. These are attackers that are successful breaching your perimeter. And the best intelligence you can create in your security program is about those incidents uh, because they are specific to you and could be that somebody's using something against you they haven't used before because they don't want to be caught. Um, so zero detection cyber resiliency is going to raise the table stakes for the attacker. It's going to make the defender's job much easier. And, and we're just on the cusp of this revolution in 2018. And if people want more information and to set up a demo, uh, you can do that on the Javelin Networks website. That's javelin-networks.com. Uh, so if you have Active Directory and you're experiencing some of these challenges, uh, you know, the team would love to, to work with you uh, at Javelin. So javelin-networks.com. I'm assuming you, there's a, a contact form they can fill out. Tell them you heard about us, uh, heard about Javelin from Security Weekly. And uh, this was awesome. This was great. And something easier than that, if you just want to send an email to hello at javelin-networks.com, again, that's hello at javelin-networks.com, uh, you'll get a response the same day, and you don't have to uh, visit the webpage. There you go. Awesome. Well, Clayton and Eyal and Joff, thank you so much for participating in the webcast today. Uh, I thought it was awesome. I, I learned a lot, certainly, and hopefully that means our audience did too. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. And again, if you, you missed portions of this, um, we will be sending you all the materials. If you saw something in the slides or the demo that you wanted to dig back into, you'll have a, a high definition version of the video uh, in addition to the slides so you can dig back in. So thank you everyone.